Thank you very much, Executive Director. Do you have any assembly members? I, I just want to, <clears throat> I want to thank the Executive Director for his testimony and for being here and for, I don't know how long you were sitting up there, but uh, I think it was a long time. And uh, the only thing I have to say about this and your testimony is there's a lot there. And I'm going to go through it a lot. We've talked about all day today. Um, the one thing that I can assure you is I'm going to be in touch with your office over the next couple of weeks to go over a few things. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Magnarelli. We'd be pleased to present to your local government committee as well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So, uh, Executive Director, I am impressed because that was a speed round. You did <laughs> extraordinarily well. And uh, as Assemblyman Magnarelli pointed out, there is a lot of information here. As you know, the Senate wants to work very closely with the counties to be as helpful as possible, and we appreciate the input very, very much, and we'll take it very seriously as we go through the budget process. Um, you know, we always want to give more relief to the counties, and we want our communities to grow, and we all want more jobs and more opportunities across New York State. So I want to thank you for all of your advocacy. I think you do a great job. So. Mr. Mr. Thank you. You had stepped out of the room. Just real quickly, um, we are calling for the uh, uh, energy plant closure, uh, transitional aid. There's a provision in there for $19 million for, t for closure on a permanent basis for municipal uh, property tax losses. We'd ask that you consider uh, including sort of a, a temporary closure at a minimum of six months as well. In your cons as you consider this budget for uh, would affect NRG in your district. Right, as you, as you know, that's a point of uh, serious concern to me and something that uh, is detrimental to Chautauqua County. Um, and so we're looking at solutions in order to address the situation. Um, so you're right, and, and I will pay close, close attention to that issue. So thank, thank you. you. I know uh, Senator Marcion had it's just, just one question. Um, in 2011, the Mandate Relief Council was established in order to review mandate relief proposals from particular local governments and then, of course, make recommendations to the legislature associated with these proposals. In 2013, the council received only four requests from municipal governments, and it was eventually dissolved. Why do you believe local governments were unwilling to submit requests to have the state review mandates through the council? Well, I feel like the uh, Medicaid Inspector General. It's very difficult to hear down here. I should come up and sit next to you and do, answer do, the questions. Do, do, no, do you I'm want not going to repeat do that. it? No, um, I did hear it, but it is difficult to hear. Um, I, you I can come I up if you want. The same thing no, that's, uh, it's okay. I couldn't uh, hear the front. The front uh, I, I don't know the answer. I think the rules of engagement with that commission uh, were not the correct rules, and that uh, we were given guidance not to submit uh, uh, programs that I've discussed with you today. Uh, that the types of things that were to be submitted for those things were more rules and regulatory issues. Uh, matters that pertained with budget-related issues were not uh, to go before that commission. Uh, so I think that um, uh, that we we need to just focus on uh, a couple of things uh, with respect to mandates. Uh, there, as uh, Mr. Magnarelli talked about, there's a lot in this testimony. There's a lot that this state requires its local governments to do on your behalf. You make these choices. You're requiring the local taxpayers to send billions of dollars in Albany to pay for programs in the past. But I'm not here about the past. I'm here about what can be done in the future. Let's try to focus in on one thing or two things. We can't just say, we've capped Medicaid and move on. You've capped our revenue and property taxes. It's going to be a problem. It's going to be painful. So we need to continue to work together on trying to identify some of these deep-rooted mandated expenditures and try to help offset some of those local costs as they grow. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, and believe that local governments are spending a great deal of money on mandated programs. It just, I just didn't understand because you don't seem to have a problem sharing Ideas. what the problems are and they're very important concerns that local governments have. I just wondered why it, it didn't go through the, the council at the time. So thank you for your response. My pleasure, Senator, thank you. Senator McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Steve, thank you for condensing your multi-page discussion. Sadly, I think many of these things are very familiar. I think you've been talking about them for years, and some of us have been listening to them for years. 
and hopefully we can make some headway. I just have a couple comments and then a question at the end. Comment on the FTE aid for community colleges, and actually I met with many community colleges today. I just want to remind people, last year that was the same request. And at the end of the budget process, our message that we had gotten back from the college community was because of the declining enrollment, the FTEA doesn't really help them to that degree. Now, hopefully enrollment is starting to increase. I fully understand the relationship with the counties and their fiscal responsibilities, but it would probably be helpful if everybody was singing from the same sheet of music as we go through the process, because we do try to you do. address the concerns that are brought forward to us. And last year it was made clear to us that the capital money that they had received was much more appreciated and necessary and fruitful. Um, the 911 surcharge, I, you know, I've gotten a little bit more engaged in that the last couple of years. As you know, Albany and Rensselaer and Saratoga counties are trying to do some coordinated efforts. Yes. And I fully agree with you that all mobile devices should be subjected yes. to this surcharge, and that's something that I, and many of us are going to be committed to uh, during this process. I also think that, and it was mentioned earlier today, you probably heard that, uh, the days of the landlines are becoming kind of, yes. they won't say obsolete, but the reality is it's probably a time to really take a more comprehensive look statewide at the surcharge on landlines versus the surcharge on cell phones because we are a much more mobile society now than we've ever been before. <clears throat> and the reality is usually those calls are used for emergencies and yes. a lot of our emergencies also happen outside the household. They happen inside, but they also happen outside. So I think that's something that I'm glad you continue to bring that up and I'm also very cognizant of the fact that sometimes the state isn't as kind sharing its resources that it collects with those revenues and that we need to do a better job that's of right. that. I know you didn't mention that directly, but I want to make sure it's stated for the record. My final comment, and then you can comment on anything you want if you'd like. Um, you mentioned the tax cap next year, I think it'll be 0.31%. We're hearing, uh, last week I had a roundabout with all the different BOCES in the region from the dozens of school districts, 0.12%. I think the Conference of Mayors will be in that 0.12% range as well because they're following you on your tail. What does 0.31% mean in total revenue across the state for the counties that you represent? It doesn't sound like it's an awful lot of money. Um, okay, so um, let, me, uh, let me just address the first point you made and then pick up on that second point. Um, we need to address 911 funding. It's very important. We're all concerned about increasing taxes and fees and charges are what you want to call them. Fine. Let's lower the rate. Let's lower the rate, but appropriately spread it out and charge the devices that are accessing the 911 system. How are we supposed to upgrade our facilities to next generation 911 to collect texting, to, to collect text? A, it's a different generation out there now. They're used to texting. I think we can actually lower the fee, but broaden the base so that we're adequately collecting the revenues. <coughs> And you're right, Assemblyman, the landlines are going precipitously down, and the use of wireless devices and tablets and every uh, other sort of uh, personal device that's out there right now that can access 911, uh, we're not collecting a surcharge. And also on prepaid plans that are being purchased now in the stores, not subject to 911, and we're losing revenue on all those plans. So thank you very much for, for bringing that up. I do appreciate those observations. You are on top of it, and I appreciate it. To answer your other question, the growth in just the nine mandates is probably, uh, I don't have a, a figure in front of me, but it's uh, substantial, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm not sure what exactly what it would be, but the growth levy that we're allowed is about 29 million. It's not a lot. 29 million in the growth. Uh, Dave is suggesting here that 0.3% equals 15 million. So this is what the state has imposed on us. We're not objecting to a property tax cap. It's done. It's five years in the making. The people of New York have too high property taxes. We appreciate the governor's emphasis like a laser, your emphasis like a laser on a very wildly popular program. But it's going to have sacrifices and it's, come, it's going to pay its price at some point in time without additional relief. There's no doubt, and I agree with the governor, you know, property taxes are too high. And I think we need to... We, we need to continue the cap. 
I think the challenge is going to be is how do we make sure we don't lose our municipalities along the way? It sounds as if we need, particularly in these times when we have such a low growth rate and we still have stagnant tax bases in many communities. And even you've listened to some of these mayors, the tax bases they're talking right. about, even if you put a $10 million project in your downtown, it's not going to bring a bountiful amount of revenue. We need to really find a at least something for this period to cover the gap and some way to find revenue that we can at least make sure our communities still provide the, the basic elemental services. We're not talking about painting the streets with gold. We're talking to make sure that the streets, you know, get, get paved. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Kruger has oh, a question. Hi. That's okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, so first, I want to thank you and the other two associations who are still waiting uh, for spending the whole day, hopefully listening to some of it. And Good I work. would just make an argument, as much as I respect and enjoyed all the mayors, we should let the associations go first next year because you actually speak for a very broad universe of, or, of localities. You. And I actually think some of the back and forth between us would go more smoothly even for the mayors if yes. we let all of your associations go first. So lobby us for that for next year. Um, Thank you for opinion. that observation. Thank you. Um, I also just want to read one thing and let everyone else, when they come up, um, respond. I don't know why you're not madder at us. <coughs> when, when I try to add up the numbers, it looks like over the last five, six years, as we've attempted to deal with budget gaps at the state level, uh, to the tune of about $28 billion in gap closing, we've made the localities pick up half of that. We've cut aid to localities by, I think, and maybe someone will challenge me, um, by over $14 billion. And so you come and you testify, and I might agree or not agree with every proposal you made. Thank you for calling out on organ donation. You're absolutely right. Um, we might have disagreements about individual proposals you're making, but the fact that the state of New York each year continues to decide to balance our budget problems by cutting your local funds to counties, cities, and towns is something, frankly, you all ought to be much more upset about, and you need to be telling us that. It's just my, my advocacy pitch to you all. So I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very uh, much. Assemblyman Otis. I'll pass. Oh. You're OK? OK, I think we're OK then. Thank you, Steve. Thank, thank you, Senator. You. Thanks. 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 Mr. Otis. What happens? You ask, you Steve, Steve, I just leaned over to Senator and said, I've known Steve for years. That was his mat. There you go. <laughs> He's going to ask the next speaker. Oh, oh, I see. Right. Mr. Baines. Peter Baines, Executive Director, New York State Conference of Mayors. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Young, Chairman Farrell, and, and all the members who are still here, the diehards. We certainly appreciate it. Um, it's I'm a Peter chain Baines. On leg. <laughs> uh, I'm the executive director of the Conference of Mayors. We represent the uh, cities and villages of the state of New York. I have with me Barbara Van Epp. She's, a, she's our deputy director. Uh, she handles all of our finance related budget issues. And, and coordinates our legislative adv advocacy. Um, I can't speak as fast as Steve Aquario, so I'm gonna have to try to say, say less is the only way I'm gonna get through this. So I'm gonna focus on two main issues uh, in the budget. Um, you know, I, I think the executive budget does make some important strides in partnering with rather than making scapegoats of local governments. Uh, and I'm going to address some of those positive things and also some suggestions we have to make the budget even better for communities across the state, whether they're upstate or downstate, large or small, uh, urban or rural. So I said two categories I'm going to speak about. One is unrestricted state aid. The other is infrastructure uh, funding, both of which you, you've heard about today. Hopefully we can add a little bit to that discussion uh, in our allotted time here. 
Um, every state in the union has a program of unrestricted state aid for its municipalities and schools. The idea is, is fairly basic, that the schools and the municipalities help generate revenue for the state, and then the state reinvests that money back uh, into their local governments. Unfortunately, New York's track record of late is very weak in this regard. And, and I actually should say it's inconsistent in that regard. We oftentimes, we just say local governments a lot, rather than differentiating between schools and municipalities. And in New York, when it comes to the state budget, there is quite a distinction made between schools and municipalities. Uh, if you look at the school segment of local governments and how they're treated in the state budget, over the last 10 years, school aid has increased by $7.3 billion. Uh, that's a 26% increase. And that money is, every penny of that, we, we, we do not question the value of it. It goes to fund education for our children, and it helps limit the growth in real property taxes. But it's gotten to the point now, after years and years of no increase in aid for municipalities, that school aid is actually 30 times larger than unrestricted state aid to municipalities. So how do we treat the municipal segment of our local governments? Uh, as I think you've heard today from some of the mayors, there has not been an increase in AIM funding since 2008. It's actually down 15% in, in real dollars over the past 10 years. And the total amount of AIM funding is $715 million in total. Uh, school, the school aid increase in each of the last three state budgets, the, just the increase in school aid in each of those years was larger than the total amount of the AIM program. So the question we have is why, why the different treatment? We think there's a clear nexus between schools and the services they provide and municipalities and the services they provide. Um, as, as we say, uh, communities that aren't succeeding are going to lead to schools that aren't succeeding. Uh, we, we need to make sure not only that we're investing in our schools, but we're investing um, in our municipalities. Uh, you heard, I think, from every mayor today about the AIM program, probably the most we've heard about it in, in years. Uh, the AIM program, which is what used to be called revenue sharing, which is unrestricted state aid, uh, it, it's critically important to our members, especially the larger cities who, who get the, the vast majority of AIM funding. So we, we firmly believe that AIM funding should be revisited to see if it can be increased to help the larger cities who in many cases have the most needs. We do think New York City needs to be part of that program. They are one of our constituent cities in this state and should be included in that program. But we also think the, the a larger group of local governments, cities, towns, and villages, no matter what their size is, there are things we can, there is a way to help them in a significant way without really costing the state relatively that much money and at the same time address this property, this oppressive property tax cap we've talked about that is, is 0.12% for villages in June, for school districts in July, for large cities in July. Um, for the towns, counties, and, and, and cities that adopted their budgets for January of this year, their, their limit was 0.73%. Um, our cap, it's referred to as a 2% tax cap. It's not a 2% tax cap. The state has a state-imposed spending cap of 2%. It's a flat 2%. Ours floats downward. It's, it's virtually zero now. Uh, our cap does not exclude capital expenditures. The state spending cap does. If you looked at state spending last year and you included the capital in, like we have to include it in, it would be over a 5% increase. So we're told that by some to do as the state does, but it's not a fair comparison when you really look at how the, how the tax cap uh, operates. It's taking its toll on our members. Fund balance is dwindling uh, uh, of our cities and villages. There's re there are a steady reduction in the size of the workforce. And the capital investment that we've all acknowledged today is so important has been basically halted in our municipalities because of a lack of, of, a, of a steady revenue stream from the state. So our suggested solution to this problem with the tax cap, uh, we know the tax cap is here to stay. We know nobody wants to revisit the tax cap and open up the statute and, and maybe make it a hard 2% cap. 
But what we're suggesting is, is a sort of tax cap equalization aid, where every local government in the state, every city, town, and village, if they stay under their cap, whatever it be, whether it's 0.73%, 0.12%, if they continue to make the efforts like most of them have been to stay under that cap, that the state would make a payment to them equal to the difference between how much their levy would be able to go up under a 2% cap versus how much it's legally allowed to go up under the real tax cap. Um, statewide, if every city, town, and village complied with the tax cap so that they could qualify for this aid, it would be approximately $100 million in funding. Um, but we think the advantages of, of doing that are worth the $100 million investment. I think there are four main advantages. It would demonstrate the state's commitment to partnering with municipal governments in helping to achieve full tax cap compliance. It, it would replace a portion of what we call the killer property tax with the state's progressive revenues. It would, so there would be a portion of the, the property tax being offset. Um, it would generate real property tax relief and support essential local services, just as the $23 billion that goes to schools helps control school taxes and support school services. And finally, it would create a, a hard 2% tax cap, in essence, without having to go into the tax cap statute. Um, we do think, though, uh, there does need to be, an, in, in addition to that, uh, a look at those municipalities that under the state controller's uh, fiscal stress monitoring system, those municipalities that have a high fiscal stress score, that they receive some additional aid on top of that, that tax cap equalization aid. Secondly, uh, infrastructure funding. Uh, Mayor Madden from Troy really said it better than I could ever say uh, what, what the, the challenges are confronting, confronting cities and villages, large and small. Uh, we're very thankful for the initiative the legislature, assembly, and senate and the governor took last year in creating the water and wastewater grant program. Uh, and we're very uh, excited that the governor is up the ante by $100 million in the executive budget. Um, but as you may know, the, the subscription, it was oversubscribed, I should say, the application, uh, the funding round of round one for that water sewer or water wastewater money. There were approximately $800 million worth of grant applications submitted. So as you can see, there's still a tremendous need. So we do, we do encourage you to concur with the governor's request and hopefully find within the bank settlement money some more uh, significant uh, funding to add to that to that program. Transportation wise, the governor's budget is very positive. We think, um, from what we can tell so far, it, it approximates that parity that we think is important between upstate and downstate, between roads and bridges and the MTA. Uh, we do have some concern because we don't really know how the the 2.5 billion in Pave New York, Bridge New York, and extreme weather. Uh, money, uh, how it's going to be allocated between local governments. Are only a few going to be eligible? Uh, we'd like to see something more like what the county said, where all of that money goes through the CHIPS formula, which is a proven formula and would get money to all local governments. Um, lastly, I, in the infrastructure realm, I just want to mention the downtown revitalization program. We have said for years that, that we think downtowns and main streets are, are being, uh, have not been given the attention from the state they deserve. Uh, we are happy to see the governor has proposed $100 million uh, for downtown revitalization. Uh, we are very concerned, though, that it would only go to 10 downtowns, and each REDC would be able to select just one downtown. I think that's that's not even a fair task to put before the REDCs. They have to pick between uh, all the downtowns that are on the cusp of, of succeeding within their regions if only they could get the state investment that they need. So we would rather see the $100 million for the downtown revitalization to be spread out among a larger group of downtowns rather than uh, just the 10 that are under the governor's um, proposal. So I apologize for going over by a minute or two. Those are our, our key priorities this year. Thank you for your patience and your stamina. And we, as always, are ready to come and talk to you and, and, and uh, outline our proposals in further detail if you'd like to see that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Otis. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Peter Barber, thank you for your, your great work and advocacy. One question about uh, water infrastructure projects, and you gave the numbers there about how much interest there is uh, from municipalities in that. Um, do you have some feedback, or can you get some feedback post this about um, how much of, uh, how many of those requests are coming from communities that are under consent decrees or EPA DEC enforcement actions, which drive some of the numbers um, for the fact that uh, we need more money and, and great uh, credit to the legislature and to the governor for supporting this program and, and the governor increasing it. Uh, but if we could get some sense of the magnitude of the need based upon enforcement, that would give uh, some valuable information to the legislature. That, that, that's a great point. We do not have that data, but hopefully, you know, working with your offices, we can get that from DEC uh, because I, I would suspect just the municipalities that are under consent orders from the DEC or EPA could could eat up that money pretty quickly themselves, which shows you that you know even the most urgent need uh, would consume a large chunk of it. But we're we're would really like to work with you to to, to identify that that overwhelming need. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any senator? We appreciate your testimony. Oh, no. Thank, you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Peter, on the tax equalization aid, which basically is dealing with this abnormally low tax cap, the, you know, 2% is 2%, but it's actually 0.12% right now. So... 0.12%. 0 0.12, right. right. <clears throat> so I just want to make sure I understand this. So you're basically <coughs> proposing that the state provide that revenue for that, that delta, that whatever that difference is. With the caveat that, of course, that the community doesn't vote to exceed the tax cap, so they can actually budget that money as firm revenue for their budget. And you're not saying it's impermanent. So you're just saying, you know, as the tax cap, maybe it'll go up to 0.85% next year, that that would be a lesser amount of money the state would have to contribute for that year. Yes, it's really meant as a sort of an emergency effort to help local governments uh, deal with, I don't think anybody in the legislature or even the governor's office saw inflation going down to near zero when they enacted the tax cap and said it was 2% or inflation, whichever is lower. So. I think inflation, as it drifts back up toward 2%, the amount of that aid on an annual basis would shrink. But, you know, in the short term, uh, you know, this year, I think without some, that kind of assistance, notwithstanding the greatest efforts of local governments and school districts, the, the, the percentage of noncompliance with the tax cap is going to go way, way up from where it has been. I'm trying to picture this because essentially, you know, one of the challenges of the tax cap is that you know, because we have this tax rebate and the freeze rebate, these rebate checks that are coming out, um, you know, you've asked, you ask the average taxpayer when they look at their taxes in 2014 and 2015, they look at their bills, they went up. So they're not always seeing the difference. Some people tend to forget the check that shows up after right. the fact. In this situation, in a sense, unless I'm reading this wrong, I wouldn't see a difference in the increase of my, provided we met the tax cap, Right. Local government. And this could apply to school districts as well, which I've heard this more prominently lately with, with school districts. But basically, looking at my tax bill for year one and year two, provided they met all the requirements, we wouldn't see an increase. That's right. Which is it, really true taxpayer relief up front. Would right. you agree? It would, it, would, it would short circus this short circuit, this circus, I guess I should say, of they pay higher taxes, the local, uh, local residents, they pay higher taxes, then they wait for a rebate check to come back, hope it's the right amount, whereas this would say, local government, you've made the effort to stand under the cap. We acknowledge that the cap is extremely low and too low for you to provide the services you need to provide, but if you can make the effort to stay under it, we, the state, will make this payment this year to make you whole so that it is, in effect, a 2% tax cap. It's very interesting to be interested in following up on that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm note. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I did have one question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, welcome and so happy to have you here. Thank I you. just, uh, 
I had a question. Um, as you know, the executive proposes a $20 million um, fund for municipal consolidation and restructuring under infrastructure capital, and the funds would be awarded to a county or other local government that pursues shared services and consolidation, which results in the greatest permanent reduction in the property tax burden. And I wanted to, I know you may have touched upon it a little bit, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. What do you think about the executive's $20 million consolidation contest? And also, as a second part to that question, do you believe that this will incentivize local governments to consolidate? 